Well, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. Whenever you're watching this worship video, we are so grateful that you are taking time out of your day to worship God with us here at Brighton United Methodist Church. Welcome to this very special Veterans Sunday edition of the, of the uh, virtual worship for November 14th, 2021. Now, we've got a big service in store for you today, including a very special honoring of our veterans here in our community of faith. And uh, we want to just take this opportunity to thank all of you who have uh, committed in your life to serving uh, your country and to uh, protecting our freedoms. We are so grateful for your sacrifice and willingness to serve. And we want to thank and honor you, not just in this statement, but a little bit later on today, we'll have a, a, a video in our worship that will honor you as well. Now, we want to make sure that you're remaining connected with us. Things are getting busy around here. We've got lots going on, and that means we want to send you to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com. There you can find all the information about our ministry. You can find ways to get connected with us. You can register to be at our in-person worships. Uh, you can find all the information about our church and how you can become involved and how you can uh, connect with our staff and our leadership. Now, we also want to send you over to our Facebook page there. You can connect with us Monday through Friday at noon Mountain Time for the Midday Prayer Break, where we supercharge our prayer lives together and join in scripture and prayer and, and fellowship together there on Facebook uh, Live. We also uh, can go to our events page on our Facebook page and find out information about all the upcoming events and ways that you can uh, be involved in our ministry here at the church. Uh, including, of course, our hybrid uh, Bible study, which is uh, digging into uh, Advent. We're getting a jump start on Advent to learn more about what Advent is all about so that when it gets here, we're ready to take advantage of it. And uh, that is meeting Tuesday mornings at 9 o'clock. You can meet us here at the church or you can meet on Zoom and all of that information is under the events tab on our Facebook page. You can get, in fact, all of the information and all of the inspiration that you need to get through your week with us and, of course, with God uh, here at Brighton United Methodist Church. Now, as we make the transition into worship today, we are invited into the atmosphere of God's presence through the words of Psalm 16. Let us hear the word of the Lord together. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good part, I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out, or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a godly, goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of my life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures evermore. Friends, we come together calling upon the Holy Spirit of God, the presence of the Almighty, to dwell richly among us as we gather in fellowship to worship God together. We gather here because in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. And so we come seeking that presence, longing for that fullness of joy that God might truly be our portion. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we hunger for your portion. We long for your presence that we might experience your fullness of joy. And so, Lord, we call upon your Holy Spirit to be poured out afresh upon us as we gather in worship today. Lord, come into our hearts that they might be strangely warmed. Come into our minds that we might be truly inspired. Take hold of our lives, O God, and transform us to your glory. This day and forevermore we pray in the mighty name 
of Jesus. Amen. We begin our time in prayer with a prayer of confession. The prayer of confession is where we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives to reveal for us any way that we are sinning and falling short of God's glory. When that's revealed to us in the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we confess our sins to God and then we repent, turning from our sin and embracing the power the Holy Spirit gives us not to fall in that way again. And when we confess and repent, we discover the miracle of the gospel, which is that God is more ready, willing, and able to forgive our sins, far more than we ever are to confess or repent. We will gather today in sharing in a general prayer of confession, followed by a moment of silent prayer where I invite you to lift up your personal confessions to God. And then we will come back together again, uh, embracing the forgiveness of God afresh in Christ Jesus our Lord. And now, let us join together in our prayer of confession. Have mercy upon us, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out our transgressions, wash us thoroughly from our iniquities, and cleanse us from our sins. For we acknowledge our transgressions, and our sin is ever before us. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Heavenly Father, in tender mercy, has given His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And for His sake, forgive us all our sins. So by the authority of Christ, I therefore declare to you the forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, having freshly received the forgiveness of God, we gather together our voices, our hearts, our minds in declaring our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Would you join me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and of earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. 
He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we continue in prayer, we want to first begin by inviting you, if you have a joy or a concern that you would like to share with your church family, to take advantage of our prayer email address at brightonumcprayers at gmail.com. Send in your prayer request there, and when you do, they come directly to me. When I receive them, I lift them up in prayer, and then I send them along to our prayer warriors that we might keep you in prayer throughout this week. Give us the privilege of praying with you, and praying for you. Together we will contend for your breakthrough in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you would like to be a part of our prayer warrior email team, it's as simple as going to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com. Uh, find the link to MailChimp where you can sign up to receive our updates and keep your brothers and sisters in prayer with us. And now, friends, on this Veterans Weekend, as we have spent uh, time this week remembering and thanking those who have served our nation to preserve our freedoms, we are going to prayerfully experience uh, a, a beautiful slideshow uh, incorporating uh, information from many of the veterans who have served and who are a part of our congregation here in Brighton United Methodist Church. While we experience that, I want you to uh, think of those people that you would add to this list. Who in your life has served our country and given uh, what they could that our freedoms might be preserved. I want us to prayerfully experience this together as we lift up those names and thank God for their commitment and service. Let us now join in prayer.
even as we remember their service, we now come together to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark. In chapter 13, we're going to read verses 1 through 8. Let us hear the word of the Lord together. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings? And Jesus asked him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us. When will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, grace be yours and peace from Jesus Christ our Lord. I was just this past weekend in uh, New York City uh, supporting my wife, Raven. I'm so grateful to, uh, to Mickey Haas and uh, her skillful and uh, prayer-filled, uh, spirit-filled leadership in uh, bringing the word for you last week and uh, for all of the volunteers and lay people who helped make last week's worship possible. Uh, so that I could be there to support Raven. She ran just wonderfully and uh, did so well. It was such a thrill to be able to be by her side and to watch her do so well in, in running the New York City Marathon. I'm still not sure why she runs marathons, but uh, uh, I suppose we all do our thing, right? She's not sure why I play rugby, but I'm so grateful uh, to be able to be there with her. And it was a return for me to New York City. I had been there before, but something struck me this time. Uh, there is no place, probably no place, more suited at least, to demonstrate the capacity of human beings to create. New York City is just this testament to what humanity can create with ingenuity and, and innovation and creativity. Subways and statues and giant parks, believe it or not, I couldn't believe uh, the size of, City Park, or of, of Central Park. Buildings standing hundreds, thousands of feet into the air, all standing as a testament to human ingenuity and creativity and the capacity for a creation. It really is a testament uh, to God's uh, creativity in creating us, right? We are to be image bearers of God, and God is the creator. And so if we are to bear that image, it only makes sense that we would be creative as, as human beings. But then I returned from my trip. Uh, returned from my trip having seen New York City and seen all of the, that ingenuity at work right in front of me. And I read the gospel reading that was assigned for this week. I be, it begins with as he came out of the temple, as Jesus has been teaching in the temple, as we've been covering the last several weeks in these sermons. He comes out of the temple and one of the disciples says to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. 
You could almost be standing in Times Square looking around at all of these tall skyscrapers going, look at all these large buildings, Lord. These disciples traveling from the, the sticks of Galilee to Jerusalem. And this is probably the most magnificent thing they are likely to ever see. This massive temple to their God. As they come out of the temple, they look at these giant stones we've seen in, in members of our congregation who have traveled to the Holy Land and seen some of these stones still left in place after many centuries. How massive these stones must have been. It felt a little bit like the pastor from Colorado traveling to the big city of New York, staring up at skyscrapers and, and marveling at, at the ingenuity of humanity. You can imagine these disciples coming out and going, I've never even seen a stone that big, and yet here it is. I know it was moved by human beings, right? And placed here, how massive, how beautiful. Jesus, though, is, well, shall we say, unimpressed. That's right, Jesus is unimpressed. I mean, he is the son of God and everything, so it would take a little bit, I would think, to impress him. But, but he states this, he says, you know, the, the disciples are marveling at the stones and look at the buildings, and Jesus turns to them and says, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. Not one stone left. You marvel at this Testament to human ingenuity and creativity. And yet, I'm telling you, not one of these stones will be left upon another. Now, as all curious teachings from Jesus have a tendency to do, this sparks a conversation, right? Jesus teaches something that seems a little out there when the disciples are kind of marveling at something else. And uh, they come to him later and say, yeah, well, what was it about that? Jesus, what was it about that? And I, I, I have to just laugh because the, the text here says that, that James, uh, Peter, James, and John, remember they're sort of the inner circle. Uh, you know, we've often joked, uh, and I've heard it repeated by pastors, that you know, if, if he, they had Ringo, they'd be a band. Uh, but, uh, of course, the, the truth is that they found the Ringo of the inner circle. It must be Andrew, right? Because Peter, James, John, and Andrew, these four, they come to Jesus Tell us, they ask, when will this be and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Well, that's their question. Jesus, in his very typical Jesus-y way, doesn't seem to really answer them. Have you noticed? Have you ever noticed that when people ask Jesus a direct question, they tend not to get a direct answer. Well, Jesus is true to form. Here they say, tell us, when are these things going to happen? And what will be the signs that they are happening? And what does Jesus tell them? He says, he says well, many are going to be led astray. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars and nations and kingdoms are going to fight. There are going to be earthquakes and famines. You can almost see them on the edge of their seat, right? But remember their question. Their question wasn't about being led astray. It wasn't about wars or rumors of wars or nations or kingdoms fighting or earthquakes or famines or any of that. Their question was, when are the stones you just said were going to be thrown down going to be thrown down? And what are the signs? Well, maybe these are the signs, but, but then Jesus comes to the end. He doesn't even really give them the signs. He, he almost fakes them out, right? He's almost got them on the edge of their seat. He's eat, they're eating from the palm of his hand and and then he just sort of pulls it away. He almost fakes them out by giving them what we might expect as signs, right? Wars and rumors of wars and kingdoms and nations and, and famines and earthquakes. Surely that's going, whenever there's a, you know, somebody predicting catastrophe, that's what they, you know, the end of times is going to be shown by all of this terrible stuff happening, right? They're, they're almost there, but then he says, he tells them, these are only the beginnings of the birth pangs. These are only the beginnings of the birth pangs. So these might be the signs, but, but these are only the very early preliminary signs and they must happen. But you, you, you're not going to know. You asked for when, you're not going to get to know when. The only instruction that Jesus gives in this whole teaching, did you miss it? Did you miss it? It comes in verse 5 and it comes almost before we realize it's gone. Beware, he says, 
that no one leads you astray. That's how he begins his answer. Beware that no one leads you astray. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but we human beings are very easily distracted. We are very easily distracted, right? We're a little bit like dogs hunting squirrels, right? We're a little bit like uh, shiny objects in front of us and we completely lose track of our, of our thought. We, as human beings, are far too easily distracted. And so Jesus, when they come, they want to know when. Jesus says these stones are going to be thrown down, not one's going to be left. And they're like, when is this going to happen? What are the signs? Give us the, give us the, the dirt, right? Give us the, the inside scoop here, Jesus. And he says, beware that no one leads you astray because he knows that as human beings, even these human beings who have seen Jesus heal and they've heard him teach and they've followed him around Galilee and now they've, brought, they've followed him to Jerusalem and they're about to see a spectacle for sure in the crucifixion. He knows that they will be far too easily led astray. Beware that no one leads you astray. Look at these disciples in this passage, right? They're distracted. Jesus has just been teaching them in the temple. They're distracted by the magnificent buildings, by the, the awe-inspiring stones, right? They're distracted by a desire to know when it's going to happen when Jesus teaches that they're going to be torn down. They're distracted by conflicts. They're distracted by earthly factions and kingdoms and nations struggling for power. They're distracted by natural disasters does any of that sound familiar to anyone? Any of that sound familiar to you? Those stones the disciples admired are admirable even by today's standards. If you see pictures of those stones that still remain, they are incredible. It is incredible that human beings, absent modern equipment, could move them, let alone place them. But they stand in as a representation of our own ability as human beings, right? We can be distracted by our own ability as human beings to accomplish, to create. We can become too full of ourselves, that's what I'm saying. We can be distracted from God by our own abilities. But Jesus calls them and calls us back to the reality that our creativity operates in the world created by the creator of everything. Right? Paul says, now I see in a mirror dimly, then I will see face to face. Our ability to create is marvelous, but it pales in comparison to the creator of all. We can be distracted by our desire to predict to anticipate, to know the future. Why is it that we always want to know what's going to happen? We think that we talk ourselves into even knowing what's going to happen, whether we have any real knowledge or not. We, we watch election night returns, eagerly expecting what we want or what we've talked ourselves into, whether it happens or not. We long for that predictable end to a sporting event. We long for that, that, that knowledge of what will come in the future. We, we stay so hemmed in, so, so uh, risk averse that we, that we don't want to take any unnecessary gamble because we can't predict the future. We can't know how it will happen. The disciples come and they, we can be so distracted just like the disciples by our desire to be able to predict and anticipate and know the future. When is it going to come? That's what they want to know. That's what we want to know. We can be so distracted by political debates and posturing nations and outside threats. Can you imagine how much of our lives are consumed by the inner bickering Republicans and Democrats? Big government versus little, federal versus state. All of this posturing, all of this debating, all of this churning of distraction. The posturing of nations. 
Who's got the bigger arsenal? Who's got the greater will to use it? Who has leverage over whom? And outside threats. Worried about, well, fill in the blank. It was the Germans, then it was the Soviets. What is it today? Terrorists. We can be distracted by awesome threats of natural disaster, right? You just turn on the news and you, you, you hear about wildfires and hurricanes and earthquakes and floods and tornadoes and, you guessed it, pandemics. The threat of nature to our very way of life. We can be distracted. And these all overlap, right? They all overlap. But it all comes down to Jesus' instruction. Beware that no one leads you astray. Beware that no one leads you astray. How are we to avoid being led astray? How are we to remain focused in the midst of all of these distractions in life on what matters most? Well, to do that, we must remain focused beyond the distractions of this world, dialed into what really matters. And to understand what really matters, all we have to do is look back on what Jesus has just finished teaching. We've been covering it over many weeks in sermons, uh, even uh, Mick, uh, uh, Mickey picking up with the, the, the story of generosity, the, the, the widow's might from last week. You know, Jesus teaches love God with everything that you are. Love your neighbor as yourself. Last week, Mickey reminded us of Jesus' call to give everything you are to God. When we love God, when we love neighbor, when we give it all to God, we cut through the, dis the distraction. When we experience awe and wonder at the accomplishments of humanity, when we must place it in the context of God's awesome creation. We must say, this is something that points to the Creator. This is a beauty that points to a beauty beyond. When we find ourselves caught in the grind of political debate and international conflict, we must lean into our call to love the neighbor despite the difference. We must lean into that call to be as God to the neighbor. When we find ourselves overwhelmed by the destructive force of nature, we must focus on giving our everything in service to God. Giving everything in service to God will eventually spill out into loving neighbors as ourselves, helping to provide for their needs, helping to tend to their wounds, helping to band together as the body of Christ. When we find ourselves distracted by life, we are called to focus ever more on the gospel of Jesus Christ and our mission to share it. We can't get distracted by wanting to know when things are going to happen or how things are going to happen. How God is going to work out this trouble. How God is going to get us across the finish line. What God is going to do to mend the brokenness of of the individual, the church, the community, the nation, the world. We find our, when we find ourselves distracted by life, we are called to focus ever more on the gospel of Jesus Christ and our mission to share that gospel, no matter what's going on, no matter where we are, no matter what our circumstance. Beware that no one leads you astray from the gospel. We must remain focused. We must focus through the distractions on the God who calls us to serve. Can we do that? By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can. Amen. Are you ready for your homework? I hope you are. I know Mickey gave you some homework, and I'm grateful for, uh, for her as the substitute, right? Giving out some homework for you. Hopefully you took her seriously on that as well. Now, our homework is about applying what we've been talking about in our worship, in our, in our message today, to our everyday lives. And that begins for us with the Thirsty 30. That's 10 minutes of Bible reading, 10 minutes of prayer, 
10 minutes of worship, 30 minutes to God each and every day. So important to do that. And this week, our our, uh, reading assignment is going to be to dip our toe into a scary uh, a scary portion of scripture for some of us, right? Uh, I often joke that it's okay, I've read the, the end of the story and we win, right? And the, the, by the end of the story, I mean, I've read Revelation. God, God is victorious over all that ails us, right? Over all that we face in this world, God is victorious, amen? And so to remind us of just how victorious God already is, I want to challenge you to read Revelation. Read Revelation chapters 21 and 22. This is the the new heavens and the new earth, right? The new Jerusalem. This is the the, the beautiful picture at the end of John's revelation of God fulfilling all of those promises to us. And here's the thing. We can get so distracted along the way by all of life's turmoil. Whatever is going on in life, whatever's going on in our world, It can be so easy to be distracted. So I want you to read Revelation 21 and 22 this week. Read it over and over again. Read it every day. They're not long, but they're beautiful. And pray it if you can. Bring that into your prayer life. And while you're doing that, I want you to think, what is one thing that you are allowing to distract you from the gospel? What is something in your life that that you are allowing to distract you from the gospel? And how might you set that aside and focus ever more? on the gospel of Jesus Christ, that good news, okay? Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we can be so distracted in this world. We can be preoccupied with our own trials and tribulations. We can be distracted by our own ingenuity and creativity. and We can misplace our awe in the creation of human hands, that we overlook the awesomeness of your creation and our place in it. Lord, we pray that you would order our steps, that you would reorder our lives, that you would truly focus us in the midst of distraction on the good news, the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray. Amen. As we gather for worship on a a week where we're remembering the sacrifice and the commitment and service of those men and women who have uh, dedicated themselves to protecting our freedoms, we are also reminded that we are called to give what we have, that we have been entrusted with all that we have by the creator of the universe, and that our creator, our loving Father, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit calls us to be the generosity that he, that he wants to see. We are called to give generously, not because God has need of our treasure, but because God knows that you and I have need to share our treasure, cultivating that generosity in our hearts and inspiring it in the lives of others. And so we are called to give to the ministries of God. If you would like to give to the ministries of God here at Brighton United Methodist Church, you're welcome to do so in a couple of ways. First of all, you can mail us your donation. We do, in fact, get the mail. You can log on to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com forward slash donate and make your donation there. Or you can set it up with your financial institution to send us your contribution automatically. However you do it, we want to thank you first for your generosity and encourage your continued giving that we might serve God in this community more and more. And now, dear friends, may we Give generously to our Creator. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for all that you have entrusted to us, and we pray that you would bless these, our gifts, a portion of what you have entrusted to our care, to the ministries of this church, 
to the service of your gospel, to the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, bless these gifts that all might come to know his amazing grace and his unending love. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. go from this place, may we go to cut through the distraction and focus on the gospel. May we go to share that gospel with all we meet. And as we go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.